the kinds of relations that we certainly want to have with governments of the United States. We say so because we've enjoyed over the past 200 years, perhaps, very important and cherished relations, perhaps even historic relations with the people of the United States. And indeed, we'd like to have those relations with those people complemented with strong and very firm relations with the government. It is very difficult introducing the Prime Minister of our country because we've heard so much over the past four years and before 1979. The Prime Minister of our country, as you know, returned from London in 1970 and started a practice of law and also at the same time practicing law engaged in the politics of our country. In fact, his return saw the, a new movement in our country, a movement that attempted to bring politics to the people. In fact, a very important period in our history because before 1970, the politics of our country were in fact the politics discussed inside the par parliament buildings where the parliamentary de democrats so-called engage in arguments that in fact did not involve the broad, broad message of our people. And so his coming meant also the coming of the new Jewish movement, a party that we have admitted is in very many ways, or has been in very many ways, an unconventional party since it did not decide and has not yet decided to engage in the kinds of politics that seek to mystify issues and confound the peoples of our country, in fact, the peoples of the world. The kind of politics that expose the issues, and in fact, the kinds of politics that seek to mobilize the people, always in defense of their own process, of their own revolution. was from 1976 not only an elected member of the parliament of our country but also the leader of the opposition in parliament. In 1979 of course he was, he became the prime minister of our country, he leads our revolution, he in fact symbolizes and epitomizes the finest revolutionary tradition of our country starting with Marichal, with Butler and all those and outstanding heroes in the history of Grenada. I have a feeling that I am beginning to make a speech. <laughs> I have a feeling that I should not, in fact, make a speech. Brothers and sisters, I wish to present the leader of our revolution,
people responsible in Hunter College for lending us this facility this evening. I know it is very difficult to find places that can hold a lot of people in New York. And therefore, we are very happy to have been able to get Hunter College. Dr. Hodges, who spoke before me, was very kind in his remarks. And I would like you to express our appreciation to him and to ask him to convey to all at the College the, our deep gratefulness for having been able to get this. to 
all of his people and with revolutionary organization, the love, the respect, the concern, the admiration, and the fraternal feelings of all of us to the people of South Africa.
United States, we may well discover that there are more religions living in the United States than the whole population <laughs> of religions.
that read in 1983, not 1793. <laughs> How can countries still operate on the basis of not having an official permanent channel of communication? <laughs> the question of ideological differences the question of different parts of socio-economic and political development, the question of geopolitical perspectives and of strategic consensuses and whatnot, is really neither here nor there in the finances. The fact of the matter is, if there is no established mechanism for holding dialogue, then there is no basis on which relations can be maintained in an effective way. We believe it is in the duty, it is in the interest of both the peoples of the United States and of Grenada to have normal relations between our two governments. We believe that is important because too much is at stake here. Too many of our own nationals live in this country, and too many American citizens and students live in our country. There is a need for some kind of mechanism to be established. And that is why we have been struggling so hard over all of these years to try to get some of the basic norms re-established. Let us exchange ambassadors, we have said. They have rejected that. So we have no ambassador accredited to Washington because they refuse to accept the credentials of the ambassador we have suggested. When they replace their ambassador after the electoral victory of President Reagan in 1980 and the new ambassador came out in 1981, he was not in fact accredited to Grenada. So we have to talk presumably using loudspeakers. <laughs> and even when we write letters, like I did, for example, in 1981, on two occasions to President Reagan, in March and again in August. First letter, short letter, making the simple, obvious point. Look, you are a new president. We had hoped that as a new president, you would have taken a new look at the situation. That you would have been anxious to start off on as good relations as you can with all countries around the world. We had hoped that you, therefore, would have wanted relations normalized. And we went on in that letter to make the point that what we are saying is the true bottom line is dialogue, it is talks. Therefore, let us get these talks going. We are proposing no agenda with any preconditions. Let us look at all questions. Let us put them all on the table. Let us see what you perceive as problems. We will tell you what we perceive as problems. Let us see if in the course of those discussions, we can narrow down differences. So at least the new beginning that is made will be begun on a basis of mutual understanding with less distrust and less suspicion. No reply to that. The second letter was August 1981. And this was a very long letter, about 12 type pages. And the reason there were 12 type pages was not because there were 12 type pages talking about an agenda. There were 12 type pages because by that time, the hostile, aggressive course of destabilization against our government by the Ronald Reagan administration had been well established. So the letter went into the question of the propaganda destabilization against us. It went into the question of the economic destabilization against us. We were able to speak about the discrimination that was exercised against banana farmers in our country. We were able to speak about the attempt to offer money to the Caribbean Development Bank on the sole condition that we would be excluded. We were able to raise a number of these issues, including the fact too, that in April 1981, 
when we had organized a co-financing conference to raise funds for our international airport project, the American administration sent their diplomats to European capitals trying to persuade member countries of the EEC from not attending that conference. We raised in that letter also the question of military destabilization, which was already beginning. We pointed out the fact that one well-known mercenary in April of 1981 had gone publicly on television in this country admitting that he was training mercenaries in Miami for an invasion of our country. Admitting that he was recruiting mercenaries. This man's name, as some of you may have seen that program, was John Day, a well-known mercenary. And we said, well, how can you allow this in your country? There are international conventions against this kind of thing. And sending Marines directly to somebody's country is no less a sin than allowing mercenaries to be supplied, to be trained, and to have a logistical base on your own territory. So we raised all of these points. Once again, we said we are willing to talk at whatever level is deemed appropriate. Let us make a start. Again, no reply. So the fact is, Sister Members, we have had this long, long history of trying to see in what ways relations could be normalized, of working very hard at trying to get some form of dialogue going, and we have had very little success in this regard. But I really want to say tonight that we do believe it is important for us to continue that struggle. And therefore, notwithstanding the difficulties in the way, we deem it very advisable for us to continue to press for a full normalization of relations. But of course, as we press for normalization, we are also going to continue to build our revolution. We are also going to continue to consolidate our process. In the face of all of the difficulties, in the face of all of the economic destabilization, the political, diplomatic, and military threats and pressure, we don't intend to roll over and play like an ostrich. Oh. We are going to stand up. And as this unemployment 
goes deeper and deeper into the society, the people who feel it the most are the poor and working people, the massive footpaths. Massive cuts in social welfare. The cuts are not coming in the arms race. The cuts are not coming out of the arms budget. I understand the talk is to spend three trillion dollars over five years. The mind bubbles. Three trillion dollars is not even three billion, which is three thousand million. But it is 3,000 billion. And if you work out 3 trillion dollars over 5 years, which is what, about 1,745 days, if you work that out, you will discover it comes down to a spending of 1.6 billion United States dollars a day. 1.6 billion. That is the kind of money that is supposed to be consumed in ours. But while that kind of money is being consumed in arms, hospitals are closing down. Jobs are being, more and more retrenchment is taking place. Pensions are being reduced. Medic Medicaid is being reduced. In other words, the arms is swallowing up the money. The people are not benefiting. This crisis in the capitalist world, moreover, has led to a situation where more and more of their countries, especially in 1982, were able to experience only negative growth. Their economies were growing, but growing backwards by minus 5% and minus 4% and minus 3%, right up and down through the industrialized countries. But the effect this has had on us in turn, countries of the developing world, has been to also create a crisis in the developing world. In the developing world as a whole, it is now estimated that our debts exceed $650 billion. That is how much money we owe collectively. And it is not just the amount of money that is owed by one or two well-known cases like Mexico or Argentina, where you are talking about staggering debts of over 80 billion dollars. But perhaps over 35 countries of the developing world now owe about 1 billion dollars or more in debt. In a context where they are still unable to create the necessary surpluses and to repay the debts. Just servicing of debts alone is causing massive problems for the country of the third world. Last year, $131 billion was spent on the countries of the third world in just servicing their debt, just paying the interest, not one cent back on the capital. And that took $131 billion. Last year too, the amount of money that we lost, the purchasing power of the countries of the third world fell again and fell very, very dramatically. It is estimated that over the last two years, in fact, 1981 and 1982, third world developing countries lost $85 billion in purchasing power. Purchasing power via the credits we lost, via the real prices we should have gotten for our commodities, which we lost because the prices of our commodities keep falling, and via also high interest rates. These three combinations meant this massive loss of purchasing power for third world developing countries. But on top of that, we are also discovering that it is becoming more and more difficult to engage in trade with the countries of the Western industrialized world. I have some figures here from Latin America that are very instructive. Well, first of all, in terms of the total world trade figures, the developing world as a whole, in 1955, that is to say some 30 years ago, 
In 1955, the developing world as a whole had 40% of total world trade. But by 1969, some 12 years ago, that figure had dropped to 25%. In other words, we lost 15% of the world market in the meantime. For non-oil developing countries, the drop was even as dramatic, notwithstanding the fact that they were earning fairly large surpluses from oil. Trade is also increasingly difficult for us because of the high tariff barriers which are put up in pursuance of protectionist policies, tariff and non-tariff barriers. But even as they make it more difficult for us to trade with them, the whole question of aid, which at one time used to be regarded as a kind of duty that the developed capitalist world, the developed industrialized world had, if duty it was, that duty has virtually disappeared. Because the reality is that aid has also decreased quite dramatically for third world countries. Long ago, the United Nations set a target that all of the developed industrialized countries should aim to provide us a 0.7% of their gross domestic product. And so far as I know from the latest figures we have seen, not one single industrialized country has yet attained that target. And far from attaining that target, collectively, they are now giving only 0.45% of their GDP as aid. So trade is virtually out, aid is also going. In the old days also, it was possible to supplement some of this through direct investments. In Latin America, some years ago, if you take 1946, about 40 years ago in Latin America, 43% of all direct United States investments went to Latin America, 43%. But by the beginning of the 70s, that 43% in fact had dropped to 17%. 26% of the investments had been shifted away from Latin America and into Europe. So more and more, when there is money to be invested, the investments are no longer going to the third world developing countries. The investments are either staying in their own countries or going to the countries of their friends. So investment is also a problem. But on top of that, the international financial institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, in the early period of those banks, it was a bit easier to have obtained loans from the banks. The International Monetary Fund, as you know, is the only source for balance of payment support. And the World Bank can be a source for projects, project lending. Project but more and more, because of the influence of one or two countries, in particular of one country, it is now becoming virtually impossible to get loans from the IMF or the World Bank. In fact, we know that there is a hit list which has been developed with countries like Grenada and Nicaragua, Angola and Mozambique on this hit list. And once any of these countries make an application to the International Monetary Fund, regardless of how good technically their program is, the instructions are to try to find all possible ways of blocking those sources of funding. Grenada has had an experience on two occasions already. And we are now going through a third experience in that regard. So we understand what this hit list can do to third world developing countries that are looking for ways of financing their public investment program. But not satisfied with all of that, what they have now done after cutting off aid, cutting off trade, cutting off investment, making it virtually impossible to get money through the international financial institutions, now they are forcing more and more third world countries to go directly to the international capital market, 
to the big commercial banks to get loans. And as you know, when you go to one of these banks to get a loan, first of all, you have to have what they call a credit rating. And to get that credit rating, you have to go through the same old bank and hire it. So everybody can get credit rating. But even after you get a credit rating, you have to then deal with the question of very short repayment terms and very high interest rates. They have all kind of fancy words they use, 1% above the labor. <laughs> and when you translate those words, it's 16 and 17% interest. That's like really what it means. It sounds good. It sounds like a pill that is killing you, but you can't, you know, it sounds like a sweet. But the reality is that by forcing us more and more to have to go to the international capital market, the debt trap is intensified even more. In the 1960s, if you look at statistics for the world, you would probably have discovered that less than 1% of all money borrowed from the international banks was being borrowed by third world countries. Less than 1%. But by today, that figure, that percentage, is substantially raised. And that is why collectively, we have the $650 billion of debt that we have to pay back. And while all of this is going on, sisters and brothers, there are so many people in the world who are unemployed, so many people in the world who are going hungry, to bed hungry every single night. So many millions in the third world who are illiterate and whose governments either do not care or feel they cannot do anything to solve that problem. Unemployment, hunger, malnutrition, disease, illiteracy. These are the crimes and the sins that are visited upon the poor developing countries of the third world, while the industrialized countries continue to exploit our resources and to keep the profits. Yeah. 
down by over 15%.
out of every dollar is spent on health and education, that means something. In this country, the figure is probably nearer to 10 cents. They look around and they understand that year after year, inflation is being held reasonably in check. Last year it ran at 7%, while real wages ran at 10%, thus ensuring an overall increase in the standard of living of all of our people of 3%. An overall increase in the quality of life and of what they were able to receive. They are able to look around and recognize that year after year, production is increasing. Last year in the state sector, production went up by over 34%. And in the private sector, production also rose. Last year too, there was a tremendous rise in the export of non-traditional products, in the export of fruits and vegetables, for example. Trinidad and Tobago and neighboring Caribbean islands to places as far away as the United Kingdom. The increase in exports of fruits and veg last year went up by over 314%, which is a massive increase in a short period. There were also increases in production in areas like flour, clothing, and there was a slight decrease in the area of furniture. But in the first three, relatively substantial increases. At the same time, there were some increases in the area of our traditional export crops, nutmegs, cocoa, and bananas. Though in the case of nutmegs, there has been a tremendous problem which our country has had to face, and that is to say, a great difficulty in obtaining seeds for the nutmegs. When you are producing something like nutmegs, which is really meant primarily as a spicing flavor for foods. When there's a crisis or a recession or whatever the fancy name is you use, then people stop putting the spice in the food. <laughs> and therefore you're not going to start the And that is one of the difficulties too that we have faced. But our people in Grenada are not only able to see these economic achievements in the broad terms in which I have described them, but they are able to feel what these benefits mean to them in a concrete and material way. Because today in Grenada, the money that the people of Grenada used to have to spend, for example, when they went to a doctor or a dentist, that money they no longer have to spend because they now have free health care. They now understand that the number of doctors in the country have more than doubled. Moving from a ratio of one to every 4,000, one doctor for every 4,000 before the revolution, the present ratio is one doctor to every 2,700 of our population. <laughs> Moving from a situation before the revolution, where there was just one dental clinic for the whole country, today there are seven dental clinics, including one in our South Island of Caribbean. Moving 
from that situation in the first six months of the revolution, 109 students went to abroad.
total strategic importance of education on all fronts, political, academic, skills training, on all fronts, the importance of that. In a situation particularly like a country like Grenada, which are likely to say a country like Vietnam, that does not have a certain kind of cultural background and tradition. Because what I thought is a background and tradition we have had. It is a background and tradition that has generally speaking worshipped materialism. It is a background and tradition that generally speaking has meant that because of the ravages of colonialism, our people have always seen themselves as transients. Our people have always had a visa mentality. And the whole point was to catch the next quarter of the Coming out of the colonial experience and fed daily all of the rubbish that we are fed through the newspapers, the radios, the televisions, where they are proclaiming the virtues of materialism, where they are proclaiming the importance of every single person having a video and having the latest kind of radio that only came out six months ago. <laughs> Not to mention the newest kind of shampoo. <laughs> That kind of thing feeds consumerism, feeds economism, and then pulls the society back. Uh -huh.
These are now the property of the people and they form part of the Our people now understand that what they put out will come back, whether through free health care or free education, whether through the number of jobs that have been created, they know it is coming back. The free milk distribution program in our country. Last year in a small island like Grenada, 73,000 pounds of milk were distributed free every single month to over 50,000 people. They have Thank you. 
of the report. Like when they say that we need a violence human rights. When they say to us, how come you are detainees? What about the press? What about the elections? When they say to us, where are your elections? They don't turn around at the same time and say to their friends in South Africa, Thousands were locked up without charge of trial. 
ever interfered with for what he says. No one has ever interfered with for what he writes. In fact, today, criticism is deeper than ever in society in a constructive way. But our people also understand that the first law of the revolution is that a revolution must survive, must consolidate, so more benefits can be done. And because of this fact, the revolution has laid down as a law that nobody, regardless of who you are, will be allowed to be involved in any activity surrounding the overthrow of the government by the use of armed violence. And anyone who moves in that direction will be ruthlessly crushed. We are going to want to put rights into the Constitution. 
which rights can be enforced in a way that the people can themselves manage, and which rights, once the remedies are provided, the remedies will in fact be allowed by our government. A constitution of real teeth. Our new constitution also is certainly going to institutionalize and entrench the systems of popular democracy which we have been building over the past few years. Yeah. 
done over these years is basically twofold. One, the creation of mass organization development. The national women's organization, the national youth organization, the farmers union, and of course the labor unions, the trade unions. Before the revolution, Gary had passed a law in 1978, the Essential Services Act, which took away the right to strike from the workers of our country. We not only repealed that law, but instead we passed a new law, Recognition of Trade Unions Law, under which any time in any workplace, 51% of the workers indicate that they want to form or to join a union of their choice, that union must be recognized by the employer. Not only were the women of our country without work before the revolution, the women of our country were also the most harassed and victimized of any section of our population. Those few who were granted jobs from time to time, many of them were given those jobs only on the basis of a sexual favor. The women were being sexually exploited in return for jobs. The very first decree of the revolution was to outlaw sexual victimization and exploitation of women.